Hey, everybody. Welcome aboard the Starship Red May. I'm your captain, James Kirk. Our mission is to explore the universe, to find uh, communist planets everywhere and learn from them what we can and to rescue uh, people from the lost planets of capitalism. Uh, we have a great show today, which I would love to get right into. Uh, Walter Benjamin, message in a bottle, or if you pronounce it the American May, Walter Benjamin, message in a bottle. Uh, I'm very glad to have as our mo moderator today, Johanna Goss. Johanna is an assistant professor of art history and visual culture at the University of Idaho and the executive editor of Media N, the Journal of the New Media Caucus. Her forthcoming publications include the edited collection, uh, Nervous Systems, Art Systems and Politics since the 1960s from Duke and, and also four catalog essays in Ray Johnson's uh, uh, company at Art Institute of Chicago from Yale University Press 2021. Uh, Johanna is also a longtime Seattle residence. Welcome again to Red May, Johanna. Take it away. Thanks, Philip. Welcome to Red May on this beautiful May 15th. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with you to uh, hear from a brilliant group of scholars um, for our panel this morning, Walter Benjamin's Message in a Bottle. Uh, our panel is um, exploring Walter Benjamin's On the Concept of History, also known as or referred to as the Theses on the Philosophy of History, which was written in 1940, two months before the fall of France and six months before his suicide. It remained unpublished until after the war, um, after which it arrived like a message in a bottle, like a memory flashing up in a moment of danger. The text bristles with striking formulations, cryptic but evocative figures such as now time, the angel of history, the tiger's leap into the past, the weak messianic power that each generation is endowed with, the state of emergency in which we live. And of course, for myself as an art historian, his reading of Paul Clay's Angelus Novus has exerted a profound impact on how we understand this artist and this painting. Today, Red May has invited three scholars of Benjamin's work to address this enigmatic testament whose urgency speaks to our present moment. And particularly, I would add, the past few days in which we have witnessed horrifying instances of racist and fascist violence, this panel takes as its point of departure a line from the sixth thesis um, from the concept of history. And I hope you'll indulge me as I, I read it in full uh, just to set the stage. So this is the sixth thesis. To articulate the past historically does not mean to recognize it the way it really was. It means to seize hold of a memory as it flashes up at a moment of danger. Historical, materi historical materialism wishes to retain that image of the past, which unexpectedly appears to man singled out by history at a moment of danger. The danger affects both the content of the tradition and its receivers. The same threat hangs over both, that of becoming a tool of the ruling classes. In every era, the attempt must be made anew to wrest tradition away from a conformism that is about to overpower it. The Messiah comes not only as the redeemer, he comes as the subduer of the antichrist. Only that historian will have the gift of fanning the spark of hope in the past, who is firmly convinced that even the dead will not be safe from the enemy if he wins. And this enemy has not ceased to be victorious. So this sixth thesis in particular provides the epigraph to a volume um, called Walter Benjamin and the Demands of History, which um, I used to prepare for today's panel. And this came out in 1996, so a quarter century ago, over a quarter century ago. Um, I'd like to read just a few lines from it, from the editor's introduction by Michael P. Steinberg, entitled Benjamin and the Critique of Allegorical Reason. And then I will introduce our, our panelists and we'll, we'll just dive right into it. So this is Steinberg. Benjamin teaches us to historicize in an expansive and enriching manner. His own historiographic practice extends the categories of experience available to the historical scholar 
as well as the investigative and interpretive strategies that can be employed. The dialectical image and the richer and more precise use of allegory are two principles that have added to the historian's instrumentarium. Yet this Benjaminian generosity enrichment has an austere cast. The austerity insists on the materiality of life and experience, past, present, and future. Austerity and richness restore historical moments neither as costume warehouses for witty antiquarians, nor as instrumentaria for current political agendas, but as a dimension of the present which must be engaged critically and necessarily self-critically. Histor historical understanding must leave behind instrumental reason in its two modes, the use of the past for the present and the use of the present for the past. Past and present connect in a relationship of dialogue and allegory where the present is real, but the past is also real. Thus, the urgency of the sixth thesis on the philosophy of history. So thank you for indulging me that little short reading. And now I will go into our panelists' bios for this morning. Our first panelist is Esther Leslie, who is a professor of political aesthetics at Birkbeck University of London. Her books include various studies and translations of Walter Benjamin, um, including the very influential Hollywood Flatlands, um, animation, critical theory, and the avant-garde, as well as synthetic worlds, nature, art, and the chemical industry, and liquid crystals, the science and art of a fluid form. She has worked on the aesthetics and politics of milk and butter as well. Her next book-length work to be published with co-author Sam Dolbear is a study of the political and cultural milieu of Benjamin's childhood friend, sound pioneer Ernst Schön. Our next panelist is Micah Gleim, who is a philosopher and artist, currently living in Brussels, and senior researcher at the University of Applied, Applied Sciences in Fulda, Germany. Walter Benjamin has been an important imaginary interlocutor for her philosophical and artistic approach. She has founded and co-edited the journal Anthropology and Materialism, together with a group of international Benjamin scholars, and from 2012 to 2016, conducted the artistic philosophical project, The Atlas of Arcadia, which I believe she'll show us. There you go, Atlas of Arcadia, beautiful. This book took the arcades project of Benjamin as a point of departure to write a visual social history of today. The project led to numerous exhibitions. Um, currently, a piece is exhibited at the Museum Verbsfede in Germany. And the work has been published in the book that is partly a picture book and partly a theoretical approach with the same title, which you just saw, which Walter Koenig put out in 2020. Beautiful. Her publications further include What Would Virginia Woolf Have Said About This from 2018 and The Government of Democracy from 20, 2009. Her main research interests lie in democratic theory, critical theory, and gender studies, and she critically explores what we perceive as given and unchangeable, questioning the authority of history and empowering alternative readings, often at the crossroads of art and philosophy. And in addition, her artistic work has been shown at the Museum of Modern Art in Salzburg, the Palais de Tokyo in Paris, and the Fabry Coats in Barcelona and Kunsthaus Hamburg. Thank you. And finally, we have Daniel Morenza, who holds a PhD in cultural studies from the University of Leeds. He is the author of Walter Benjamin and the Aesthetics of Film from Amsterdam University Press in 2020. Great, we've got good show and tell today. <laughs> he has co-edited a special issue of the Journal of Cultural Studies and Critical Theory Parallax on the topic of barbarism. He has taught at Aston University, Newcastle University, and Trinity College Dublin. So welcome to our fabulous panelists, and I will now hand things over to Esther, who will be our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm really pleased to be back at Red May, what an extraordinary set of events. I have a short paper to read and um, I do have some slides. There we go. Super. So our prompt was the set of theses by Walter Benjamin called On the Concept of History, a final piece of writing, a finished and simultaneously unfinished piece of writing. It's a set of thoughts 
word images, a series of short paragraphs that is thesis-like in a sense, or thesis-like in the sense that, as with other theses, it's comprised of dense formulations of both diagnosis and proposition. It's part of a form that sits on the meeting points of writing and action. But not in a straightforward way. The images that the theses evoke have given rise to more speculation than can be imagined. Tigers leaping, mechanical Turks, new angels, heliotropic plants, subduers of the Antichrist, weak messianics, braids and grains, and beads on a rosary, and victory parades, and shot clocks. How to turn these enigmatic, very beautiful theses into work on the world, political work? Why did Benjamin number each one? Is this a manual, a guide, a set of instructions? Is there some progression at work here? A linearity moving forwards one by one, imposed in spite of all Benjamin's philosophizing contained within the very theses that would suggest rather that we should think and look in and at coils and convolutions of history, coils and convolutions in thinking, not forward movement, but sudden stops, a cessation of happening, so is this part of a joke on a reader or is it some sort of art of politics that would recompose all that we think we know about the workings of time and history and what it means to progress, to move forwards, onwards, upwards or in other directions? And were the theses never meant to be read, not by us or anyone much? Of course, they have been read, intentioned or not. No scrap of Benjamin's work remains unturned over, like the soil he imagines as the literal terrain of experience. No scrap of Benjamin is lost before the tribunal of analysis. This Benjamin, who has he become? He's certainly a lively publishing prospect. He's been many art exhibitions, some films, some radio programmes. Just about a million PhDs, including mine and Daniel's. A political thriller starring Colin Firth still in the works. Benjamin is never laid to rest, even if he was once interred, more or less, when on the 28th of September 1940, a funeral following Catholic rites was held for a Dr. Benjamin Walter. The name reversed for a man in transit, Mistakenly, mistakenly assumed to be of Catholic faith. This man is that one who may or may not have had some theses or an arcades project in his suitcase. He was a man about, about to become a mystery. He had been moving through a landscape, his perspective changing, until he could move no more. And now he's caught, immobilised, perceived from many angles, but like a landmark, like the memorial that marks the space of no longer having to remember, he is stuck. Such persistence, but as multiply reconsidered, reconfigured existence, skews what Benjamin identified here in his thesis as elsewhere in what might be the productive and revolutionary relation to a past, one that refuses to drop, to stay fixed, one that refuses to let things drop conveniently, thing-like, into a lap. For Benjamin, the past springs out of time in order constantly to be reconstellated, especially at moments of danger or opportunity. The experience of joy that eluded us in the past might yet find its moment, its reintegration into some sort of flow of time. From a negative side, though, Benjamin observes the same, that even the dead will not be safe in the recounting of history if the enemy wins, and the enemy, he notes, has not ceased to be victorious. The past, history, departed people clothed in the fabrics of remembrance. What has been 
is also what is being remembered, what comes into each present through what Benjamin calls the Penelope work of recollection, which is as much a remembering as a forgetting, is a work of the mind, the dreaming mind, in which night unravels what the day has woven, and it is the work of a wakeful mind of daytime when the fragments of insight are collected together under new laws and new lights. History is never done, is never done with. It opens up again and again. It opens up in wishful thinking. If only it were otherwise, if only day were night or night day. The day after this night when everything, or the important things at least, like visa restrictions, are of a different order. How can it all end differently? How can it not end with Benjamin's death on this border? His colleague Max Horkheimer challenged the perspective of reopening history, observing blankly that the slain are really slain. There is no last judgment in which the dead rise again. What is past is past. But Benjamin insisted that while under certain lights that may be so, under others it is not so. Some glimmers persist and convey a weak scintillation into each present. That scintillation is that of possibility and also of avenging, a task undertaken from energies of hate, avenging the amassed injustices of so long. This is not really, or the theses are not really about what happened in history. It's about what is remembered from history and how that memory might shape a future beyond itself. Benjamin is clear, taking his line from Marx in the thesis, that the oppressed are constantly robbed of their history, encouraged into empathy with those deemed safe or worthy by their rulers. Their own memory is always in danger of eradication, always undermined in favour of the grand and official narratives of power. Whoever has emerged victorious participates to this day in the triumphal procession in which the present rulers step over those who are lying prostrate. In this process, Benjamin tells us, historical memory is handed over as the tool of the ruling classes. In a preparatory note for On the Concept of History, he criticises historical recounting that depends on telling the antics of glorious heroes of history in monumental and epic form, and yet is in no position to say anything about the nameless, those who are the toilers in history, as much as those who suffer the punishments from those who hold on to historical agency. His own mode of historical construction, he tells us in the note, is devoted to the memory of the nameless. It is able to remember the repressed of history, who were history's victims and its unacknowledged makers. Benjamin constructs a revisioning of the past, wherein the historian bears witness to an endless brutality committed against the oppressed. This he understands to have been Marx's task in Capital. Capital is a memorial an anti-epic memorial, pulsating in the present, insisting on redress. Marx's sketch of the lot of labour is presented as a counterbalance to the obfuscation of genuine historical experience. Marx memorialises the labour of the nameless, whose suffering and energy produced wealth in the vast accumulations of commodities. In Benjamin's Arcades project, it's possible to see how such a stance has been mobilised in his own revolutionary telling of history. The Arcade project's panoramic history of 19th century Paris features, variously, the Paris Commune. Resting on the shakiest foundations, that revolt was doomed in some sense to fail and left historians by Benjamin's time of writing in the 1930s already come to know that, to know that inspiring as it was, it is an emblem of spontaneous refusal, uncompromising insurgency, but it lacked a carefully prepared social basis. It rises quickly like an untethered balloon that can soon enough be pierced and deflate. But in contrast to those who dispense political reproaches about 
failures in political and social form. Benjamin lingers on the devilish detail of hellish events in and after the commune. Included amongst these are the commune's demonic power of critique. While visiting the first exhibition about the commune in Saint-Denis in 1935, Benjamin notices a placard from the 15th of April 1871 during the commune. It proposes a communard memorial or communard monument to the accursed. Hammered into this monument would be all the names of the official personalities of the Second Empire who made what the monument calls an infernal history. Napoleon I is included, the villain of Brumaire, the chief of this accursed race of crowned bohemians vomited forth to us by Corsica, this fatal line of bastards so degenerated they would be lost in their own native land. Baron Haussmann, architect of the wide boulevard, arch demolitioner of Paris, is dishonoured too. He made Paris ready for the sweeping through of military vehicles. Had they come to mark their own revolutionary history, had they not been defeated, the Commune would not have invented triumphal glories in stone, but rather took the Commune as the consummation of an infernal history, its sublation, its output, the justification. What do official historians do with its memory? It's an orgy of power, women, wine and blood, writes Charles Luandre in his 1872 study, Subversive Ideas of Our Time, just as the commune begins to retreat into memory. Wine hints at exuberance, the joy of taking back the streets, the intoxicatory effect of revolt associated with the commune. Blood is the blood of repression, the brutal shootings of the communards in the bloody week of 21st to 28th May. It is the blood spilt by the communards, who in desperation as their numbers fell and they were forced to withdraw into the centre of Paris executed hostages. And it is women, the mesdames sans culottes, the laundresses, seamstresses, bookbinders and milliners who formed the union of women and organised the food and fuel supplies. Powerful women, women who demand power so it might be redistributed to all. The Paris Commune became a hellfire, scorched by the forces of reaction. Benjamin tells of fugitives executed after a chase through the underworld of the skeleton-filled catacombs. Benjamin points out how Blanqui, champion of insurrection, sees in the Commune's defeat only an eternity of repetition, the end of history. But Benjamin opens it up to historical time differently. He perceives instead that its end marks the end of a phantasmagoria, and so it is a moment of awakening. The phantasmagoria was the promise of universal liberation, a promise only broken time after time by the bourgeoisie. It becomes ever clearer since then, he notes, that every manufacturer lives in his factory like a plantation owner among his slaves. What are Benjamin's legacy, his many returns? In repeated remembering into our present, Benjamin remains incomplete, ever again openable to the contemporary world with its changes and continuities, which change him what he is, was and will be. These returns bring him into renewed relevance. He's not dead. He's always still crossing that border, a border that is the same border and a different one. The border that separated Vichy France from fascist Spain. It's the border that confronted people fleeing in opposite directions, some like Benjamin and his fellow refugees moving towards the Atlantic, moving west to a possible life in the Americas. Others, revolutionaries and republicans, reversing the route, fleeing from Franco Spain to France. Benjamin persists, the border persists there where Benjamin died and elsewhere. There is the Mediterranean that thwirls, swirls through and below the scratched up glass of Danny Caravan's memorial to Benjamin at Port Boo. There is a border that can be breached or that can force the drowning of bodies in the attempt 
Spain is one destination for the rubber dinghies launched from North Africa. With luck, their fleeing passengers reach Spain, the United Nations recent, recently noted that over 3,000 refugees, asylum seekers and migrants, died or went missing in 2021 while trying to cross the Mediterranean and Atlantic seas. They come from Tunisia, Morocco, Mali, Guinea, Eritrea, Egypt, Ivory Coast, Senegal, Syria, Iran and Afghanistan. If Spain is reached, it is a Spain where memory is unsettled. Franco was exhumed from his grave at the Mausoleum of the Valley of the Fallen, a fascist monument in 16th century sepulchral style, built in part by Republican convict labour, beginning the year Benjamin died. Beneath the fascist crypt are buried some of the many dead of the Spanish Civil War, tens of thousands of who lie unidentified there. One corpse recently was given back its name when a glass eye was discovered. Will the fascist night yet yield to a bright day through investigations, through digging through the layers of soil? Or will the new fascisms of our world cast the past into another light as it tortures the present? Walter Benjamin cannot be absent from this inquiry and these many inquiries. He's one of those who wrote his thesis towards action on the recurrent injustices of the present. He must persist. He doesn't stop being relevant. So thank you. Next, we have um, Micah Gleim. Oh, I think you're muted, Micah. There you go. Still muted, Micah. There you go. Okay, hello, hello. I thought Daniel Morenza would speak less next, after Esther. That's that's absolutely fine. I was going in. Daniel, I thought you wanted to speak second. You're also muted. I, I, I can do it. I mean, to be honest, it doesn't matter to me. I'm so sorry. Go ahead, Daniel. If if you'd like to go second, that's not okay. So so I can I can do my my presentation. First of all, um, thank you, Johanna, for the introduction, and thank you, Philip, and all the team from Red May for like inviting me like to talk today. I think it is it's great to be part of like such a such an amazing series of, of talks um like 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 this one. So what I'm going to do is try to address why such a complex uh, such an intri intricate text as like the thesis and the concept of history are still like so so compelling today for a contemporary reader. And I think one of like the reasons is um, that warning that we get, that if we understand history as a progression, we are betraying the past in a way, and maybe as well leading humanity towards catastrophe if we are not already in that catastrophe. And I think this takes a special significance in the context of the current uh, climate uh, emergency, which may lead to the destruction of the planet. Do you think like the thesis are also compelling because they provide um, alternative to escape from that vision of history as automatically moving forward and as well articulate concept of justice that regards our position in the world as so in solidarity with but also fighting against not only current um, injustices but also past ones. So yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, Benjamin Jesus in this in this text is using both Jewish and Christian sources like for like this materialist, materialist historiography because he's interested in concepts such as messianism and the judgment day. And I think like the concept of apocastasis, uh, which refers to the restoration of all things at the end of times, is particular, particularly important for this historiography because Benjamin thinks that the past can be redeemed. This means that the lives of those who were oppressed and their struggles cannot be for forgotten under the history of victors or justifies, justified as necessary suffering for their grandchildren, social Democrats were doing. 
past, in other words, is an unfinished business. So the failure of past individual and collective projects is seen as uh, the privation of a right. And from the present, we have the duty of doing justice to that past, to the past of the press and to the past as well of all those projects which were never finished. The interesting thing that Benjamin is doing here is that for him, every day can be judgment day, meaning that every day we have like that weak messianic power that Benjamin is talking about to redeem those lives, to redeem those experiences. And I think we need to do this, uh, to do this before it is too late because as he warns, even the lives of the dead can be appropriated by the ruling class. In many, in many ways, um, the, the thesis follow a very traditional Marxist tenet, which is to criticize social democracy. So in this case, Benjamin is criticizing the social democrats' conception of progress. Well, he could have criticized many others uh, from the left who were also blinded by, by this concept. So he's doing something that he had started in uh, Edward Fuchs, collector of the historian. So Benjamin told Max Horheimer in a letter, the thesis saw their stark difference with a positive conception of history. For Benjamin, positivism leads to an empathy with the past, which is, for him, an empathy with the victors. And he criticizes the use of methods from the natural science in historiography. The idea of progress that so social democrats are defending comes precisely from such a conception, one that doesn't take into account that uh, development of science, of knowledge, of culture, and even civil rights is guided by the ruling class. I think this cartoon by the Spanish political cartoonist uh, El, El Roto expelled well that illusion of progress as something automatically positive. In the th uh, thesis A, which comes at the end of the essay, Benjamin pictures an image of the way that historicism under the idea of progress understands and narrates history, establishing casual links among events as one counts the beats of a rosary. For Benjamin, however, history is much more complex and multi-layer, and the historical materialists should be aware of it. In thesis 11, Benjamin compares the social democrats' faith in technological development with the technocrat uh, technocratic features of fascism. This is seen in their conception of labor as the savior of all human beings. The point for them, for like Didzian, but for the social democrats in general, is only to perfect the labor process. However, such a conception of labor is based on the exploitation of nature, which is naively uh, contrasted with the exploitation of the proletariat. As Benjamin develops in other texts, the conception of technology as the mastering of nature is an imperialist one, because it entails the exploitation of human beings as part of nature. Labor, and under this logic, under the logic of capitalism, will always be exploitative. But social democrats don't understand that such a logic may also lead to the retrocession of society. I think this anti-war poster of, uh, labor part of the labor, British Labour Party from 1935 understands well, for example, that militarism is negative for the working class because it's not going to give them any benefit, but falls under the same problem of understanding that labor, even in the hand, hands of capitalism, is automat automatically positive for the working class, which is realizing that actually like that, that very uh, same labor also means capitalist exploitation. Technology for Benjamin should be a space in which humanity establishes a better and healthier relationship among humans and between humans and nature. This is why Benjamin argues in another text that technology bears the key to happiness. However, technology under capitalism is self-destructive. Its evolution can only lead to catastrophe as it develops in the, section, in the section Fire Alarm in One Way Street that I'm going to read. If the abolition of the bourgeoisie is not completed by an almost calculable moment in economic and technical development, a moment signaled by inflation and poison gas fur all is lost. Before the spark reaches the dynamite, the lighted fuse must be cut." End of quote. In other words, progress is leading to catastrophe and it must be interrupted before it is too late. Benjamin 
criticizes the social, uh, social democrats' conception of labor as a secularized form of the pro Protestant ethic. By contrast, uh, by contrast, in the thesis 17a from the Prolly Promena, Benjamin supports Marx's secular, secularization of Messianic time in the idea of a classless society. In a way, this is the idea of origin is the goal. Society will return, but will also live forward to that period before primitive accumulation, accumulation in which classes didn't exist. However, social uh, democrats conceive the present as an anteroom, as a waiting room in which to wait for the emergence of the revolutionary situation. For Benjamin, there is always a re revolutionary chance in political action to point at that classless society. But that movement should not be understood in linear time as moving forward, but also to, towards, the past, um, towards the past, a past that can be accessed from any, any possible time, as Benjamin uh, puts it at the end of the thesis when uh, he says, for every second was the small gateway in time through which the Messiah might enter. For that reason, Benjamin understands this entry, this revolutionary chance as a miscarried inter interaction in history. He expresses it as follows, speaking back to the idea about the fire alarm that I mentioned previously. He says, Marx says that revolution are the locomotive of world history, but perhaps it's quite otherwise. Perhaps revolution are uh, an attempt by the passengers on this train, namely the human race, to activate the emergence break. End of quote. Revolutions, therefore, are not about moving forward, because that will mean to follow the same idea, the same path of progress that has led to fascism, to global exploitation, to environmental catastrophe. Revolution is about interrupting the course of history. Some notes to the thesis, Benjamin also mentions more clearly what he develops in thesis six, seven, and 17 about the points that a materialist historiography needs to avoid to liberate itself from the idea of progression. First, it must escape from the concept of universal history, which now it cannot be conceived more than as a kind of Esperanto, he says. Secondly, it will avoid the common idea that history can be narrated, or at least can easily be narrated. And here is where Benjamin says that Marxism will avoid any form of epic, something that, um, that Esther was mentioning before. So he had something that I find very compelling in today's history, history, historiography. I'm going to read like the quote. It is more difficult to honor the memory of the anonymous than it is to honor the memory of the famous, the celebrated, not excluding poets and thinkers. The historical construction is dedicated to the memory of the anonymous. And of course, and I'm going to give an example about this. this. And then very related to this is the third point in which Benjamin says that we should avoid any empathy with the victor, because he says empathizing with the victor invariably in, in benefits those current, currently ruling. So now I want to put like these ideas in conversation with more contemporary debates about how should we relate to history and cultural history, particularly through the idea of remembrance, which is very important for Benjamin, because uh, with Remembrance, you can escape from the idea of history as hom homogeneous empty time, since remembrance is always like more circular, there are always like repetitions, at least once a year. So we are now quite familiar with the toppling of the status of slave traders that emerge from the Black Lives Matter movement. And you can see in the in the slide one from, from Bristol of Edward Coston, uh, which was one of like these slave traders. So what this political action of like pulling down statues and the sun is th that this type of remembrance, like these statues has been done to the victors, victors who have miserably made their fortunes and therefore their place in history by exploiting and killing black people. So this political action about pulling down statues is as much about the present as it is about the past. It links current police brutality against black and non-white people to previous situations of discriminations and injustice. 
This political action is a way to do justice to those who were enslaved, exploited, killed, and were, and were the real producers of that wealth, but also to those experiencing discrimination today. The struggle, the struggle against systemic racism cannot be a celebration of those who have achieved like the same civil rights as white people, which does not equate obviously with real rights in real life. But it cannot be either, even less so, um, a celebration of those black people who have succeeded, whatever that means. Because that will justify, I mean, any of like these two cases of celebration will justify the suffering that their ancestors had to endure. Uh, to endure. Like the point is to fight in the present in the name of the oppressed. And when I mean oppressed, I mean past and present. So there, there is now a question about what to do to honor those anonymous lives that Benjamin is asking us to do. Is it replacing the status of slave traders with status of working class people or with people who have been oppressed or have not been represented by, by history? Personally, I have my reservation about status in the sense that I think they symbolize something without um, admitting nuances or criticism. So similar to that eternal image of the past that Benjamin associates with historicism. I acknowledge though that there are like some statues that go against the very idea of monumentalism. For example, like this statue about uh, Danuta Danielson, who was a Polish woman of Jewish heritage, who was caught in a photography hitting a member of a neo-Nazi march in Sweden in 1985, a photograph taken by Hans Runesen. So that moment that fly, flits by and is in danger of disappearing was possible to be immortalized only because of the technological history of photography, something that Benjamin appreciated very much in technologies of reproduction. It is something which is really rare in studies and monuments. This is another example of remembrance that I wanted to mention today. The, the other day, my brother was in Hamburg. He was visiting for the first time in the city and sent me, uh, sent me and my family like this picture. It is a square named after Juxel Moos. Juxel Moos was a street sweeper and he was recognized for keeping clean that part of the city. For the years, he served the Hamburg city council. So nothing more and nothing less than that. Basically a square in a central part in Hamburg which is devoted to a street cleaner, to someone who was like cleaning like that part of the city. So just like to finish, street names, plaques, holidays, monuments and statues are a form, a form of remembrance. But are examples such as the ones that I gave enough for the remembrance of the past? Are they doing justice to those anonymous lives? I think Current trends in historiography, including oral history, are doing a good work in focusing more and more on those oppressed, those who were excluded from history, working class people, women, people of color, homosexual. And when I'm saying this, I'm realizing that this is basically most of the humanity. But we must also consider that our current struggles are in the name of those who came before us. We are following the, the, their struggles in our struggles. And in this way, we are doing justice to them. We are uh, doing justice to those projects of liberation that they started. And I'm going to finish with a few verses from Maxon by the Spanish communist singer songwriter Ismael Serrano. This is a song which is devoted to the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo. These were like the mothers of those who were disappeared by the last military dictatorship in Argentina. Most of them were like uh, killed by the, by the military. And they kept protesting for years, like claiming justice for like their sons. So I'm going to read a, a translation of, of like that, of those verses of the song, because I think they encapsulate very well what basically um, and Benjamin is, is, is telling us to do as well in this, in this thesis. So he says, Mother, your son is not disappeared. Mother, I found him with you walking along. I see him in your eyes. I hear him in your mouth. All your gestures hold his name. 
I see him in my struggles, he comes with me, in the sparks of every new battle. His, stro his strong hands guide my hands to the future until we win. Hasta la victoria siempre. So thank you very much. It was, it was everything. Thank you, Daniel, for that beautiful presentation. Um, we'll now turn to our final speaker, who is Micah Gleim. Micah? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm very happy that I'm last here because what I'm trying to do is opening up our discussions a little bit more to contemporary political questions. I am asking, as the title of the panel is the message in the bottle, what is the message in the bottle for contemporary writing of history, for analyzing our reality today, for our political struggles today. So what does he transmit? Um, starting, I look at three concepts of Benjamin that he used to criticize the history, history writing of his era. Are these concepts still valid? So progress, Victor's history, and the empty flow, the empty chronological flow of time. Progress as a model of history was criticized as an automated evolutionary advancement of history that without intervention of humans would automatically come to a next step of history. And um, criticizing it, Walter Benjamin refers to the surprise on behalf of the social democrats in the face of the rise of fascism. They just couldn't believe that at this stage of history, it was still possible that something like that could happen. Second is the Victor's history. Victor's history is something that we still know from the textbooks of history, lining up one victory after the other, one king after the other, forgetting about those who lost the battles, those who have suffered, those who were oppressed, those who are the victims of the victories. And the chronological empty flow of time is a time, narration of time that, like a mechanical clock, lines up one event after another, forgetting that past and present are interrelated. As Benjamin said, in order to change the present, we need to change the past. Thus, it forgets about the retrospective construction of history. So all these concepts he criticizes as they are oblivious of certain dimensions of history, of the human interventions as part of history, of the victims, of the interrelations between present and past, of the retrospective construction of history. So I'm asking whether these concepts are still valid. The automatic progress. Yes, we can say the consumerist idolatry of technological gadgets is still believing in progress. But at the same time, this technological progress also led to pollution, climate change, and weapons of mass destruction. So I would say perception, the perception of progress is at least contested. The Victor's history. Also, the Victor's history is still present in national collective memories, but it has been shaken by the atrocities committed by fascism and criticized by post-colonial discourse that reached also mainstream. Most Western countries cannot look back to history anymore without questioning the past. The Holocaust, colonial history, slavery have become part of national memories. So also the victor's history is a contested concept. Chronological empty time. Also this concept has been shaken. On the one hand, 
I would say, by asynchronous developments. We sometimes have the feeling we already live the future, artificial intelligence, robotics, while at the same time, anachronistic styles of life and war are still present. And the internet, for example, also allows different access, a parallel access to different stages of past. And on the other hand, often render something old that has been posted a minute ago because it is not in real time. So also this concept is at least contested. contested. History seems more and more a battlefield of constant ups and downs and an insecure outcome. So can we say that the new perception of history comes closer to the historical materialist a history that discovers the barbaric side of cultural artifacts and reveals the downside of an alleged glorious past. Lately, or in the last decades, the word crisis has been evoked plenty of times. And crises are indeed interruptions, signs of a discontinuous history. So is the new history, the new reality, less oblivious of certain dimensions? Unfortunately, no. Crises, these crises, have not been interruptions in a revolutionary sense. Why? Let me go back what happened. In the beginning of the 1990s, we could observe the fall of the so Soviet regime. This fall of the Soviet regime was very quickly interpreted as the victory of democracy combined with free market. And the so-called free world won, according to the narratives. The interpretation went on that we kind of reached the teleological goal of history, or as Fukuyama has put it in the 1990s, the end of history. So the new goal of history seemed only to preservation of the ultimate stage of social development. Then what happened? Like in the 1930s, the social democrats had been surprised in the face of the rise of fascism. We were very surprised when 9-11 arrived. The only difference, the model of history in the 1930s was the one of an automatic progress. Now it is the one that we reach the ultimate stage of history. 9-11 was a disturbing event in this narrative. Ever since, history seems discontinuous, unpredictable, irrational. Terrorist attacks, financial crisis, migrant crisis, pandemic, and now once more a war that reminds of an era that seemed to be past. All take us by surprise. Crisis is omnipresent. So on the one hand, we do not have any more a triumphal march of reason and progress, but we neither have a revolutionary interruptions. Why is this? So let me look at the arguments of crisis one by one. By looking at the arguments of crisis, I say I look at the loudest voice, but this voice is of course not one voice. It is a pattern of communication that presents itself as a simple observation of reality. Capitalist realism. So there were the terrorist attacks. They were linked to religious fundamentalism, undevelopment, otherness, anachronism. The response was clear. Wage war in the name of human rights. Then there was the financial crisis. It was framed as unavoidable, unpredictable market effects that we need to accept in order to have our shares of the riches. The response was clear. Austerity was said was necessary to support the banks 
in order to survive. Migrant crisis. The migrant crisis, let's say, was communicated in a more ambivalent way, oscillating between, on the one hand, the poor victims of countries that are corrupt or in war, or on the other hand, criminalizing the migrants. Yet the response, again, was clear. Control and dissimulation by pushing the crisis outside Western borders. The pandemic, first framed as a chance of change, the result is sober. The response was clear again, increased control and surveillance in the name of solidarity. And now the war in Ukraine. It unites the EU and the US against a crazy war criminal. I don't say that he is not a war criminal, but simplifying positions of good and evil, turning Western leaders into heroes behind their desks is risky. What about anti-democratic tendencies in Poland and Hungary? Are they forgotten? In reference to John Cleese here, I would not say don't mention the war, but don't mention pacifism. So why are these crises not disruptive in a revolutionary sense? Of course, as you have seen, all these arguments are incomparable. They are very different discourses, but I would say they have a common denominator. The seemingly inevitable responses. The politics of there is no alternative or brief Tina politics. And all of them have one point missing or at least marginalized. Global injustice and inequality. Arguments do not ask about equal access, access to education, information, resource distribution, why citizens have to pay for financial speculation, how to build real solidarity. The crisis, instead of being real interruptions, becomes steps in the fortification of hegemony. Crisis is linked to crisis management. Moral superiority of crisis managers justifies the means with the goal. War, austerity, Frontex, that's the border control of the EU, surveillance. Yes, notions of progress, Victor's history and the chronological time might be shaken, but a seemingly necessary and inevitable course of things has not been challenged and revealed as contingent. The order of things and the social not tumbled, the crisis just fixed, just like a garage fixes a broken car or a doctor fixes an ill person. And a new form of Victor's history appeared, a narrative of successful crisis management, terrorism, crisis resolved, neglected is the cost of some populations in Iraq and Afghanistan. The financial crisis is resolved. Neglected is at what cost it came for some citizens. The migrant crisis is under control, secretly pushed outside Western borders. The pandemic is under control thanks to cutting edge pharmaceutical products and government control. Instead of questioning inequality, these discourses re-establish divides along the lines of the own and the other, us versus the underdeveloped religious fundamentalists, us versus the southern European countries who do not handle money well, us versus the refugees from far away, us together with the farmers industry against an anonymous evil, us against the crazy war criminal. Yes, there are victims now, the victims of 9-11, the victims of terrorist attacks in general, the victims of the pandemic, or the victims of criminal migrant smugglers. But it is a selective group. As Judith Butler wrote, a hierarchy of grief could not 
could be no doubt enumerated. We seldom, if ever, hear the names of the thousands of Palestinians who have died by Israeli military with United States support or any number of Afghan people's children and adults. And I would add the countless corpses of nameless, unmourned, undocumented refugees washing up on the coasts of Mediterranean islands. History might have become more complex, contested and contradictory, but it has a blind eye to what Benjamin called class struggle. But that did, does not define in a narrow sense of proletarians against capital owners, rather as a continuous struggle of the oppressed against those who rule. Slaves, serfs, workers, the subaltern, discriminated groups due to race or gender, etc. Unheard voices. And what we need to learn and to see is that most of us are in a precarious position and have much more in common with the position of the migrant or refugee than some few people in this world. Which Ukrainian citizen who has become a refugee now and lost everything would have thought only one year ago to find herself or himself in the same position than the Syrian refugees some years ago. So now there's another crisis coming up that demands urgently to look differently at history, climate change. Catastrophic effects of climate change will be even stronger if we do not start looking at history in a Benjaminian spirit. The world will face an ever increasing conflict, migration and resource scarcity if we do not ask the question of equality in a global perspective today. And I think this is one of the messages in a bottle of Walter Benjamin. Thank you. Thank you, Micah. Um, thank you, all three of you, for your stunningly beautiful and moving and deeply urgent talks today. Um, I believe that we are going to dive into our discussion after just a brief respite for folks to get a glass of water. Um, I'm going to hand things over to Philip for just about one or two minutes to talk a bit about Red May. Um, here you go, Philip. Uh, take it away. Oh, Philip, you're still muted. Thanks, Joe, and thanks everybody for wonderful presentations. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I just want to make a pitch for some of the events that are coming up for Red May in the next week and a half. Uh, you can find all this, by the way, at www.redmayseattle.org online. On Wednesday, May 18th at 11 o'clock, we have Confronting the Obstacle to Climate Security with Kate Aronoff, David Schwartzman, Matthias Schmelzer, and uh, Sue Hildreth. 19th. May, uh, Thursday at 11 a.m., we have uh, four anti-fascist futures uh, with Ayosha Goldstein, Alberto Toscano, Diane Million. Uh, on the 19th at 3 p.m., uh, America's Unipolar Moment with Daniel Bessner, Derek Davison, Asal Rod, Spencer Ackerman. Uh, on the 20th, Friday at 11 a.m., uh, the Feminist Subversion of the Economy with Amaya Perez Orozco, Veronica Gago, Ver Veronica Gago, sorry, Liz Mason Dees and Kathy Weeks. Uh, and uh, on uh, at 3 p.m. on Friday, States of Incorporation uh, with Jandarka Kurti, Jared Shanahan, and Shimon Salem. Uh, on Saturday, uh, at 11 a.m., we have two or three th two or three things I know about Brecht, uh, with Tom Kuhn, the translator of Brecht's poetry, Asad Haider, Todd Cronin, Asma Abbas, uh, and uh, at 3 p.m. on Saturday, uh, the impasse of the Latin American left uh, with Jeffrey Weber, Karen Benezra, Andrea Marston, and uh, Martin Arboleda. So lots of good stuff coming up. Uh, uh, in order to do this for the seventh year, 
and years beyond, we need your help. We need help. Uh, and uh, we are not, as a communist festival, funded by any institution in America. Uh, so we depend on the kindness of strangers. Uh, go to our website uh, where it says donate. Uh, you can either become a patron at our Patreon, or you can uh, uh, contribute to our GoFundMe, uh, fan the flames of Red May, and uh, give what you can afford. Uh, thanks very much, and let's return to this uh, panel, which, uh, and I should say, a moment of absolute defeat uh, for us in America, looking back at another moment of defeat in 1940 when Walter Benjamin penned this remarkable piece. Uh, and uh, I think I'll lurk in this room uh, to maybe contribute later. Uh, I would love to hear what our panelists have to say and how they question one another on this. Thanks, Philip. Um, absolutely, I think the panelists um, probably have questions for one another, um, but we do have some really great comments or questions in the YouTube chat that I wanted to start off with, especially since they jump off a bit from um, Micah's talk. So. First, I wanted to um, turn our attention to a question in the chat from Noah Lundf Lundqvist, Lundqvist um, about the topic of land acknowledgments. Um, as really a prominent form, especially in, in North America today, um, in which history and memory um, and sort of the, um, you know, the triumph of, of the victors is being uh, performed publicly. So, I'd be curious to hear the panelists talk about a Benjaminian interpretation or reading of land acknowledgments um, in terms of the recognizing of First Nations or indigenous peoples who lived on lands prior to colonial genocide as, as Noah has articulated it, but how these can be frequently subsumed as performance by settler colonial um, institutions and powers that be, I think precisely in terms of our um, many of our roles as as professors or or in academic institutions, this is a really prominent and rising practice. And I would just note that I think a month ago I was at the University of Washington for a concert, and they did a land acknowledgement, a very cheerful land acknowledgement at the beginning of this this concert uh, with a packed audience of of you know. Uh, season ticket holders of, of upper middle class wealthy Seattleites, uh, predominantly white audience. And at the end of this very cheerful chipper land acknowledgement, the entire crowd erupted in, in, in applause and cheers. And the sort of dissonance between the solemnity of, of a land acknowledgement um, and that kind of almost self-congratulatory performance that almost sounds like the victors cheering themselves uh, to me. So I just wanted to open that up as an instance, since we are in Seattle or we are, um, Red May is based out of Seattle, the contradictions of the land acknowledgement. And I'm, I'm curious if any of you have, have comments or, or um, interpretations of that. Esther, you're smiling a lot. Maybe I could ask. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I have anything more to to add to to what you've already said. I mean, part of me thinks, well, you know, do we need to to step outside Benjamin's framework and 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 think about recuperation, a sort of situationist kind of idea, or um, you know, Marcusean sort of repressive tolerance, or you know, something else that kind of um allows um yeah the the those who are e effectively sort of often at, at, at one with with the ruling class to as you say sort of congratulate themselves on their own progressiveness or or almost become excited and delighted by by their capacity to mark this moment of violence, um, I think. I mean, the three the three of us, I think, are, are based in 
Europe and it, it, it it's you know quite interesting to to me to sort of wonder you know how one might extend that as a it, would one extend that as a moment of acknowledgement you know the displacement of people from common lands or you know the various battles that go that have been going on for a few hundred years around displacement of working class peoples or is there a completely different sort of set of concerns at work coming back to the Benjamin question I suppose in the way my, Micah was saying you know in a sense we do live in this time where our, our lenses around history are sort of fractured and fragmented um and and you know that that sort of moves towards his his sort of interest in the tradition of the oppressed but but what's happening is that it's not that the oppressed get to to self name or something it's it's done on behalf of uh, not um to deny that we would only be at this point um after very many campaigns and insistences to to acknowledge that original violence. I'm not sure I've said very much there. Yes, thank you, Esther. Micah or Daniel, do you have any comments? Yeah, I just would like to say as in the quote by that Daniel Morenza gave, um, unless, oh God, I, I don't really remember, but it was that bourgeoisie had to be really beaten. Only then we can be liberate new history. And in this sense, I would say also it is not enough to just um, put a memorial of somebody who freed um, slaves from slavery to change the course of history. Now we're producing new suffering, new oppressed people that have that are nameless, that are undocumented, that are like the refugees arriving in Europe, drowning in the Mediterranean. Yeah, I've been following on, on what uh, Mike said um, just now about how, I mean, in many cases we celebrate those who ab abolish like slavery. They were like part of like the same sort of like bourgeoisie or the same class that actually permitted for many years like that slave trade. I think it's not about that, it's about like giving, I mean, or putting like blacks about that, but I think it's, it's more like about knowing and trying to know more about so the followers who were um who were enslaved who were exploited and also about like those who really were like part of that exploitation and also which are like the links of the continuity that we have today about like those same um, like power relations that they have arrived today because we know that many families you know, from those people are still very much in power, or they have made a fortune, and obviously they have constructed that fortune over like the, the blood of like those people. And um, yeah, I think that was everything because I mean I can't comment on very much about you know American history, as Esther said. I mean we are the three of us are Europeans, and we don't know that much. But something that um, comes to my mind, something that I think it is important is not to impose on them like concepts. That, uh, I mean, that, I mean, are basically imposed by like the people, even like those progressive, like people who think that they should do this and this. I mean, it can be like the idea of progress, but it can be as well, like you have to give like these specific like rights and you have to follow this. And I believe what we couldn't impose in terms of like giving them back some lands is like the idea of private property. Something that it was obviously what basically took like the, I mean, it was because of that conception that I mean, some people could take like their, their lands away. So basically, you basically tell them, okay, so now you have the property of this. Basically, you can be like as well, like reproducing like some, I mean, like similar injustices. Yeah, I also find that very, very important, the last point that you gave, that in a system 
where private property is dominant. The way um, these people were referring to, to land has no place. So it would need a completely different relation to establish a different relation to land, not any one that, one that is defined by private property. Thank you, Micah. I'm going to turn to um, another question that came through on the chat um, and slightly adopt it. So we have a question about the role of technology um, and the idea of how technologies can be made liberatory. And of course, this is a, a major concern for Benjamin across all of his writings. Um, but how do we render technologies or utilize technologies in a liberatory manner and when so many seem to be employed towards oppression, surveillance, and destruction of the environment. And just as a sort of um, linking back to our topic today, I would just note that the first thesis um, of, on the concept of history uses the, the story of the mechanical Turk, the automaton. And um, I'm curious in particular how we might think about something like AI, because of course, mechanical Turk has been um, recuperated by Amazon as um, a model for their micro labor platform, which they call Mechanical Turk, um, with the mantra, the slogan, artificial, artificial intelligence. So humans behaving as the sort of, um, or the, the invisible hand beneath the apparatus. So I'm, I'm just thinking here um, about how opening his concept of history, the philosopher's history with the figure of the mechanical Turk and a sort of anticipatory model of artificial intelligence or perhaps artificial artificial intelligence might set us up to think about the role of technology in the concept of history. Big question, but on technology. Yeah, it is very interesting. I think that Benjamin absolutely not against technology, but technology can be a wonderful thing once it is detached from profit production, once it is embedded into a kind of free, playful setting of dealing with technology. And the question is, of course, like, yeah, where can we find in this world, where can we find kind of, how to say, places where we can deal with technology in this, in this liberating sense, not in a sense of um, having to bring profit to multinationals, and um, I have no answer, but I think with Benjamin, it is also always, even if we say we, it is also always the question where to find in this society options and possibilities to act differently or not only wait the big revolution. Sorry. One of the things I, I've sorry. One of the yeah. things I, I found interesting in in that quote that, that Daniel used about um, you know this this imagination of revolution as a locomotive that's sort of uh, you know powering through history a kind of technological pro progress because that locomotive is the the technology of of the nineteenth century that enables you know capitalism to to develop in all sorts of ways and colonialism and imperialism as well. Um, Benjamin says it's not the locomo locomotive powering through history, it's humanity pulling the emergency brake to stop it. But of course the emergency brake is an incredible technology too. It, it, it's just trying to produce an image of um, 
I suppose, of, of sort of conscious action of humans working together with technology in order to, you know, make decisions, make decisions about production, make decisions about where we want technology to intervene in our lives rather than this sort of um, blind movement of technology and the locomotive, which is actually never blind, but as Micah says, you know, um, directed towards forwarding the interests of of the bourgeoisie and and the pursuit of profit. So I think we we need to think about Benjamin's very dialectical and subtle understanding of technology and elsewhere in an, one of the drafts for his very famous work of art in the age of its technical reproducibility essay. He makes these distinctions between a kind of first technique, which is technique as a sort of uh, power exerted against nature and against humans or uh, working humans as part of nature, and second technology, which is this reflected type of technology and technology deployed towards ends of, of play and exploration and experimentation. So I think we and really need to think about the, um, yeah, it's it's not an anti-technology position. It's anti-particular relations of production. And, and if we think about that in our contemporary period, you know, we would be foolish, I think, to, to step away from um, some of the extraordinary technological work that's going on within the nanosphere and in all sorts of areas but we also understand that it's it's captured within systems of um, contemporary production and ownership yeah if i can speak as well because i mean like technology is basically the part that I, I like most, or like what Benjamin says about technology, I think is some of like the, the, the best part of his philosophy. And it's something that I develop very much in my in my book, uh, What Benjamin and the Aesthetics of Film. Um, so today, I mean, like, because we've been talking about like the thesis and the concept of history, we have been talking about that um, type of technology or that use of technology that Benjamin is criticizing, which is basically like that technology on, I mean, um, used by capitalists or used, yeah, used by capitalists and then understood in a, in a, um, in an evolutionary way in terms of like progress. But actually Benjamin was in a way quite very much a utopian or te technology utopian in a way. And he, even we can understand some of like his theories as like proto, um, proto, um, um uh, Posthumanism, in the sense that he was thinking even how we could include um, technology into our body. The interesting thing about like Benjamin, and I think this is like very interesting for like, from a Marxist point of view, like we could include or adapt like that technology collectively to our bodies, so basically to the body of humanity. Uh, and he makes, I mean, like following on what Esther said about like this distinction, the distinction between first and second nature, he was giving us like different ways of how we could relate to, to, to technology. So one was like this imperialist one that was basically understanding technology as basically machine nature. Machine nature meant for Benjamin as well, machine other human beings. But the other one was understanding uh, technology as a space in which we can have a much healthier uh, relationship with other people and as well within, with nature. So basically, if we were thinking about how we could use like this technology in a way that could liberate humanity, I mean, liberate humanity in a way that could help, could make like life of human peoples like better. And I think this, this is a way, uh, a way we understand uh, technology, like helping people like to improve like their quality of life and everything. And I think we can still do it as, as I said, we cannot escape from that. But the point is understanding as well that technology is never natural because technology it is made in order like to solve some problems or in order like to, 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 to reach some goals. So it is always in history. 
And therefore, we have to know whether like that technology is um, is addressing like a capitalist logic or an imperialist logic or is not. And I think if we understand like technology in that way, and as well we understand how technology is being exploitative or not to nature, I think that's how we can understand how technology can be a liberatory uh, weapon for like humanity in a way. I think it is quite interesting as well in order like to fight some of like these ideas that we have now about like the environment as something which is untouched, like these romantic ideas about about nature or the environment as something untouched by humans, which is stupid. I mean, we cannot escape from that. Uh, so we have to go back to that sort of like nature, like primitive nature and everything. It, it doesn't make sense today. Or even as well, like to green capitalism, you know, which they think that you only have like to make like some little gestures and you will find it can be like capitalism can be su sustainable. So we have to understand how can uh, technology escape from that logic of capitalism. And I think that's like an important lesson. And then we can as well try to understand how can we do like that technology to to liberate ourselves, to relate better like to each, each other. And obviously we are now using technology in order like to communicate all of us. I mean, we are in four different countries. We are reaching a lot of people. So this is part of like technology, but we have to obviously to understand then like this technology, who owns this technology, uh, I mean, who is profiting from this technology, what type of interaction does like this technology create? So we have to understand all these things as well. So it is not, I mean, uh, Benjamin was never, never, never just like um, um, a, um, you know, a conservative in terms of te uh, technology. So in the you know, technology is always, you know, like um, inspired by capitalism. It is always uh, re reproducing like capitalism. He thought that there could be a lot of like really positive things in terms of, of liberation in technology. Yeah, and I think with Benjamin, it is interesting to always look what escapes the logic of the profit mm -hmm. in any technological advancement? Is there not something like whatever we have, you know, the internet? The internet can be used for commercializing, it can be used for surveillance, but it can also be used, as we have seen, to help demonstrations, insurrections, to communicate quick in an unhierarchical way. So there's always this ambivalence. As he was speaking in his in his big work, the Archives Project, everything, the mirror can serve surveillance, but it can also show the world the beauty of the world, the light, the same. Um, all kind of technical developments have always this ambivalence. And this is also, I think, a starting point how to approach technology and maybe take it out of the hands of the mere profit logic. I think Philip probably has a comment because I know Mechanical Turk is a, is a favorite uh, topic of his. Philip, did you want to chime in? Uh, actually, I have a question, uh, and I'll, I'll throw in my my answer. But it, it's it's playing along with the conceit that we have that this message in a bottle has arrived, and that we have opened it and found each of us in the text of Benjamin Benjamin <laughs> Benjamin something that speaks to us specifically about this moment in our moment that links our moment with his. What is the message that each of you get when you open it, if you had to do it? And I'll, I'll, I'll sort of give you my take when I open the bottle. Uh, I see this as a moment of defeat uh, where uh, decades of wrong, uh, long stra wrong strategy have left us surrounded by an extraordinary, po powerful fascist right uh, that does link us in a certain degree to Benjamin's moment. I mean, one of the amazing things about this text written at a moment of defeat uh, about the time of the, just after the Republic in Spain has fallen, uh, about the time of the fall of France, I have to say that I compress 
the writing of this with Benjamin's last journey. And I almost see him writing it up as he's climbing the Pyrenees or in the hotel room before he hangs himself. Of course, he didn't do that, but somehow the image compresses in my mind. So I, I see these things linked. And uh, at this moment of defeat, Benjamin seems to combine both an extraordinarily uh, concrete political analysis of what went wrong, of the wrong strategy, that we thought the locomotive of history would, or social democrats thought the locomotive of history uh, would deliver inevitable progress. Uh, it, it simply uh, uh, didn't take the threat of fascism seriously enough and always saw the left as the worst, as, as the, uh, uh, the real threat, which I think is the situation of the liberals in the United States, where for, for years they have been punching left and reaching across the aisle to the right, uh, to fascists essentially, and now suddenly have reached that moment uh, where Benjamin describes as the current amazement that the things we're experiencing are still possible in the 20th century is not philosophical, which seems to me to define completely the liberals' response to each law that is broken by the right, uh, where uh, the unwillingness to accept that the so-called rule of law won't protect them against fascism, and that the only thing that could possibly have uh, created a force to resist fascism is a genuine anti-fascist alliance, which can only come with the left, uh, as opposed to reaching across the aisle to the right. Um, but the thing that amazes me about Benjamin in this moment of concrete political analysis, it's mixed with uh, eons of time and reaching back to the beginning of history. The, the, the combination of concrete political analysis with the notion that we, we have to redeem the past and every generation that has suffered is just amazing at this moment. Uh, this combination of concrete specifics and reaching to a kind of universal dimensions. Because one would think at the moment of defeat, the, the, the advice is now to go small, to reconquer small bits of territory step by step. But Benjamin, Benjamin is expanding the scope and he's saying, go bigger, that's the problem. Redeem all of history. So this is an absolutely amazing document uh, with this strange mix of Kabbalism and socialist strategy. So that's what I get out of it. And to try to think of what, what would be the, uh, the way to go big at this moment uh, is at least an invitation I'd like to accept from Benjamin. I'd like to hear what other people uh, see as the message to them in this bottle. Um, if I jump in here, I, I think I very much agree about about that thing around social democracy and seeding illusions in the political system as it exists. And we have our own issues in, in Britain around our very fragmented left now when when you know, the project of Corbynism, which, you know, in many ways was itself barely uh radical in a revolutionary sense but that that you know had had apparently to be smashed by by those in the tradition of social democracy who promise the jam tomorrow if we just keep our demands modest and don't upset the bosses so i think all of that is still so pertinent but i think the other message for me also lies in benjamin's idea of of a tradition of the oppressed and a notion that doesn't come here, but in his memoirs about a sort of hope in the past. And it's that thing, I think, about having, um, a, of, of not having um, this, the condescension of posterity and say, oh, in the past, they, they were all, all the people were, were racist and stupid and they didn't understand things. And only now can, can we really, you know, be properly. Uh, democratic and enact justice. I, I think what Benjamin shows me is that you open up every moment of the past. 
there is a tradition of the oppressed struggling and um, and trying to transform conditions and not just for themselves but through solidarity acts and through humor all that stuff benjamin says about you know what 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 do what do the possessionless have what they possess is humor and wit and attitude and i think that goes right back so that that's something i i um, take from that and try to scope out in in work that i'm currently doing around um uh, radical tradition in the in the area of london where i live yeah, I agree totally that that uh, phrase, the tradition of the oppressed, and Benjamin, you could write it and say something, rewrite it in America and say, the history of black people in America teaches us that the state of precarity in which we live is not the exception, but the rule. And it works perfectly. Yeah. Micah or Daniel, do either of you want to respond to Philip's question? Yeah, I think like that idea in 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 the thesis that I mean like the I mean we are living in a, in a catastrophe and we don't have to understand that as something which is something special only particular to this moment, but that happens all the time. It is important to understand as well. We don't need to be as bad as in the in the uh, in the Second World War like to basically say, I mean, to, to be at least alert of things that may happen. And obviously, I'm, uh, I mean, I'm talking in a better position than someone in Ukraine or in Palestine at the moment, obviously, it's not my case, but I think like the, the point is to understand that, I mean, that, um, that um, we are in that moment like leading to catastrophe that can come at, 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 at any moment. And I think like that idea that um, that Benjamin says about, you know, like, and this, I mean, that this may happen in the 20th century, that he, he says that this is not philosophical, is something that we still listen today. We listen, how can we have a, a war in the 21st century? And it's like the same, same idea that they're repeating because of what Esther was saying. It's like, it seems that because of like this, this idea of progress, which is not only of technological progress, this is well like a progress in terms of like knowledge. It seems that we have like more knowledge and therefore we are not going to do like the same, uh, make like the same mistakes. Or we have like that sort of like legal uh, legal framework, which is going to basically um, um, defend us from fascism or from totalitarianism and things like that. And obviously we have understood that's not the case. We still have, I mean, fascism or the, far right is rising at the moment. And, and 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 we have a war as well now happening. So I mean it's something that we have to understand that actually, you know, these things may happen at, at, at any time. And we have to be a land to be like uh, warning and saying that actually as as Esther said, it's not about like this idea of progress, whether it is technological, you know, like in terms of epistemological or or in terms of like law or rights, it is that we have to be always alert about that. Yeah, so um, in a way in my presentation, I already said what is, what I kind of subtract as a message of the bottle for today. It is, um, to completely cross cut differently, redraw the lines of divides in the world that can make us show, show, make visible the precarious position most of us in so that a global solidarity can be created other than by the dominant discourses that always recreate um, the own versus the other discourse so that in a way the precarious position of most people in this world is dissimulated and yeah ask the questions of injustice and equality and um but i have and i got a question because i mean this way of telling a victor's history 
returning to a moment of loss is also used by people that, how to say, um, are not using it in a counter historical way. As for example, Monsieur Putin last summer published a text on him, the Russians, the poor victims of this wrong writing of history that doesn't see that the Russians were the autochtone people in Ukraine, that Ukraine in reality is Russia. So what he was doing is in a way also a gesture of re rewriting the story of victims, according to his view, of course. How you how do you put that in connection to Benjamin? How can we criticize well, it? Would, would, wouldn't Putin be writing a victor's history uh, in relation to Ukraine? In other words, he's writing a victim's history in relation to the West. He wrote a victim's history in order to thrive for victory. I think Micah's comment is helping us see the utility of, of the concept of history today in terms of how it can be flipped, perverted, and that logic can be used very effectively. Um, I'll let our panelists mull that, chew on that very challenging question, Micah, um, which I think connects to all sorts of different forms of um, grievance culture and um, victim sort of claiming by white supremacists, um, including yesterday's shooting in Buffalo and in, in, in the US, the notion of, of uh, replacement theory and so forth. So white grievance culture um, and the increasing weaponization of, of victimhood in, in terms of historical narratives, I think is a powerful one. Um, I think that's very important. That's what I mentioned as well with the victims have become a very important moment in storytelling, like the victims of 9-11. It was again and again, we did never hardly ever refer to the victims in the Iraq but um, the victims of 9-11 in New York have been a very important moment in telling the story and justifying to wage war. Absolutely. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting how this grievance is used, has become a tool. Yes. Well, it's interesting also that the greatest novelist mid-century America of Faulkner has essentially written a beautiful version of white grievance culture in his sort of reconfiguration of the history of the South. The tragedy of the Civil War was what happened to the white people who lost. You know, the slaves aren't even part of that tragedy. I want to make sure we get to one of the last questions that's been asked since it's really powerful and then I think we'll be at time. It's from a Professor of Philosophy at the Evergreen State College, um, a good colleague of mine, Kathleen Amen, who's asked about the role of art um, in the concept of history. And we showed Paul Clay's painting in Los Novus at the beginning. Um, and I'm obviously an art historian, so this question is of particular interest to me, but I think also to all of you. Um, and so uh, Kathleen asks, um, what does the clay painting indicate in terms of how art can help orient us um, to the past and tend to the dead. And I think not just visual art, obviously. Um, Brecht is an important figure for Benjamin. There's many references to the arts in, in the concept of history. So um, uh, any anybody who might want to address that, obviously I know Esther and Daniel have both written extensively. Micah, go ahead. Because I did this book, <laughs> it is the kind of, um, how to say, art practice um, the interest of this book was to try to make an art case project with images. 
that has that means an analysis not of terrors of the 19th century but of contemporary history um, with the claim that Benjamin himself would have liked to write his book in images. As he says, um, I have nothing to say, only to show. And yeah, so um, we did this book, which is, for example, there is the chapter on iron construction, where he um, analyzes how iron constructions in the beginning resembled very much Baroque castles, even though it didn't fit to the material. Just to give the impression of a linear history of a still imperial side of power. And um, this chapter, for example, we reflect on with a number of puzzles that um, confront always two puzzles from two different eras with each other. There's, for example, um, yeah, here. I don't know whether you can see anything, but on the one picture you see Dubai, yeah, <laughs> the ornament of Dubai, and on the other picture, uh, Versailles. Versailles. So it's kind of um, the ornament in two different periods cut together, and um, the principles in the way the same. It is only now in a completely megalomanic form, trying to ornament the world. And the intervention is much bigger. Then there's um, a puzzle that puts together the, where is it? <laughs> the um, ideal present of Bentham. Remember the Panopticum prison where there's the tower in the middle, so any prisoner would always have the impression to be observed, be um, supervised, without seeing whether there's somebody in the tower or not. This we kind of connected with the atrium of the shopping mall. Um, most shopping malls have also this kind of atrium building where in the middle there's not the control tower, but there is the elevator that we combined here. Um, and from the elevator, you can oversee everything. So the kind of the concept of surveillance is transported, transferred into the shopping center. Then there's another one um, yeah, with utopian architecture <laughs> from the end of the 18th century, crosscut with oh, a surveillance device. Rada. Yeah, just to see, um, to show how we tried to work with images and the concepts of Benjamin to cross cut through category, through um, historical moments, to see other correspondences, other relations between the images, and to be able to open up different questions. And that's what I think art can do. I was I was wanted to underline that in relation to these ideas of of montage and uh the the ways in which he he moves us between um the image and words and in the gap between them is a stimulation to sort of critical interpretation, which is also methodologically what's at work in, in Brecht's epic theatre. I think it's the kind of a, appeal to to the audience to to cogitate and to to work out the connections, stimulating um, thinking thereby. Um, but I think that that for Benjamin as well, I think that that fascination with Kafka, with with Proust, with with other writers, is also um, a, a sense in which literature, the literature he writes about, it is absorbent of social tensions and condenses them and produces these sort of, uh, I don't know, like like material or. or 
uh, a, um, a sort of imprint, I suppose, of a social age, which makes it ripe for analysis in the way that other types of of work doesn't. But but specifically thinking about the clay image, I think it's so fascinating how his reading of it almost does subsume, in a sense, uh, that image. Now it's hard to see it without his quite particular interpretation of it and I think he was you know that that was an image that was in his possession that followed him from home to home was very precious to him and I think in that particular case there's also something about it's almost um, a meditative plate or or something you know it's something that it, in the relationship between his looking and and Clay's production produces a sort of possibility of a kind of of thinking and of thinking otherwise um, that I think Micah's work is also in inviting us to do in those connections that she um, presents before us. So that's my some of my thoughts. He seems to have had an uncanny antenna for picking out works of art at least in literature a surreal or not literature but even the, you know Proust as you say Kafka uh, surrealism Brecht he was always right he wasn't wrong on one unlike uh, you know Lucas trying to extract huge amounts of significance out of Thomas Thomas Mann uh, rather than recognizing Brecht as the real sort of radical aesthetic radical in the, uh, at the times so it's he's such a strange combination of uh, 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 insight, almost, you know, theological insight, uh, without the ability to develop a Hegelian argument for long periods that other members of the uh, uh, Western Marxism have. Uh, but yet his, his unfinished work sits there with all these loose ends that are just waiting to be developed uh, or, or thought through further. There's so many beginnings are sitting there all through the arcades project and and this particular uh, uh, essay. You can't look at it and not find a sentence that you say, well, what does that mean? It says, but what does it mean that the, the notion of a present, his materialism needs a notion of a present, which is not a transition, but in which time stands still. <laughs> you know, these are... Uh, endlessly meditable on. And I think particularly one mode we haven't talked about in depth is, is cinema. And I'm wondering if Dan, maybe you could take over and close us out. I'm thinking just in terms of what you've said, Philip, uh, what he has to say about Chaplin is so, um, yes, it remains so pregnant with possibility and, and with with continuous sort of rich generative um, implications. So Daniel, do you have any closing thoughts about cinema? Yes, um, I, I think, yeah, I, I wanted actually, as you were like speaking, I wanted to add as well, other type of art or other type of culture, which is not necess necessarily like radical or avant-garde, such as what you said, like Charlie Chaplin or Mickey Mouse. And I think something that Benjamin found quite interesting in many of like these examples as, as well as other like, let's say like mainstream, mainstream like cultural like um, objects is that you can find like the dreams and fears of a given society or even in the best cases like the contradictions of, or, or showing, expressing the contradictions of a, of a given society. And, and I think that was like very, very interesting. Immediately when uh, Benjamin was talking about Chaplin, he was trying to use as well sort of like modernist avant-garde ideas to apply to him. So in many cases, we find similar um, terminology in his writings on Chaplin than in his writings on Brecht. Uh, but something that was like quite interesting for, for Benjamin is that obviously um, Chaplin arrived to many more people than Brecht did. Obviously, there were like many people. I mean, it was like probably like the most celebrity, uh, or like the most famous celebrity in the world, like Chaplin at the time. And many people were like um, watching it. So going back to the idea of technology, what was interesting for him is that in that sort of like playful 
representation of technology. And that means as well like the space of the cinema, like thinking the space of the cinema, so the, the cinema screen as a technology. I think that, uh, for Benjamin that it was allowing people to in a way, I mean, bring that technology to their bodies, but as well like understanding that criticism to technology that we can find in, um, in, in Chaplin to their own reception of technology. So understanding technology, not only as, a, as something destructive, that can be destructive as, you know, like the machines or uh, that they were like working with in the factories, for example, but in a different way, something that can be like place. And obviously, the interesting thing here is that not every film, you know, it, it, it is revolutionary in that way, or it can be like a liberation in that way. You know, you need some sort of like um, criticism in that band and Chaplin was interesting because of that, because he was able to express the alienation of people in that age. And, and when he's talking about the way he moves, like the way that Chaplin moves, he's moving as, as an automaton in many cases, as, 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 a, as something technological, is because he has understood like that sort of like technological rationalization that many of us have. So basically people could understand and people could receive that and quite bodily. We were like sort of embodiment of that, of that critique. And I think that was quite positive. Thank you, Daniel. And I love the idea of ending on, I wish I had my, my lecture slides of, you know, Chaplin throwing himself in the cogs of the machine or walking off into the sunset. I love ending on the image of, of modern times. Um, and I thank this panel for your wonderful um, and just absolutely expansive um, insights into, into Benjamin, bringing it into our present, not that it needs to be brought, it is ever present with us, the concept of history. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. Philip, do you have any closing remarks or maybe some plugs for the funding of Red May? Yeah. Well, uh, we have a couple of days off, unless you're in Seattle. On Tuesday, you can come see the Winter Wind by Miklos Yangso at uh, the Beacon. Uh, and we start up again on Wednesday, check uh, uh, the climate security. Uh, so check us at uh, www.redmaycl.org and donate to our GoFundMe or to our Patreon. Perfect, you, perfect ending on the Beacon Cinema and supporting uh, experimental and underground venues for, for film in the neoliberal city. So thank you all for joining us. And um, we are signing off for Red May and Walter Benjamin message in a bottle. Thank you so much. Uh, one more thing, I'm sorry. I, I, they <laughs> remind ahead. me that we have a, a, a friend of Red May, a, an alumni of Red May, Andy Gitlitz, is going to be in Seattle at Third Place Books uh, May 20th. Uh, you remember uh, Andy from his uh, dazzling portrayal of Marxist alien hunters at uh, about the Ar Argentine Trotskyist Posadas, uh, who, who uh, expected the aliens, alien communists to come from space after a, an atomic war and lead us into a communist world. Uh, Andy has turned that into a book called I Want to Believe, uh, which rivals uh, the X-Files in its thrills. Andy will be at uh, uh, Third Place Books on May 20th, uh, the evening. Check it out. I think it's 7.30. I will be there. Thank you, Philip, the, the Red May hype man. Um, all right, thank you all very much. Thank you. And thank you for joining us uh, from across the pond and um, have a good rest of your day. Thanks all, bye. Thank you much. We'd love to come one day in person to Red May. <laughs> <laughs>